Welcome to another interesting conversation with On The Couch with NMC, where we have candid conversations about social issues, mental health, medical related conditions. And today, on today's episode, I'm so excited to introduce Leandre Kutz, who is a clinical psychologist, and Stephen Haribib, who is a renowned international speaker and is also a youth activist for mental health. And I think most importantly, you're an author of um, Good Vibes and Butterflies. <laughs> um, on today's show, we would like to commemorate mental health and we would like to just touch on mental health and the importance of mental health and just the suicide statistics and the structure and everything. I know earlier before we were talking about, you know, we mentioned a lot of interesting things and we just like to dive into it. And um, Leandra, I would like to start with you. And I'd just like to say, within the modern society, what is the new definition or what? how would one define mental health currently within the modern society? Well, I think firstly, the definition of mental health hasn't changed much. What is What has changed is we are more frequently now engaging in dialogue, people trying to understand and people trying to create awareness about mental health and also the factors that are affecting mental health have also changed quite significantly. But in, in brief, mental health has to do with a state of psychological, emotional, mental well-being in terms of the quality of our thoughts, the quality of our feelings, and the quality of the experiences that we have in our body. So when I say quality of thoughts, feelings, and body, it might sound a little bit strange, but that is exactly what it is. So how we think, in terms of what the content is, is it more positive, is it more negative, are we able to solve problems, are we able to participate in everyday life with the way in which we think. Then in terms of how we feel, do we generally feel pleasant, happy feelings, are we able to exper um, experience life and appreciate experiences, what is the quality thereof. And then in terms of our body, do we function in a healthy way? Are we generally tense? Are we generally tired? Are we able to participate? So basically mental health, which people often don't differentiate from mental illness, has to do with our ability to function and to participate in our daily lives. Yeah. I'm actually happy you said mental health and mental illness. Even I'll pose that question to you. Um, just being a mental health activist there with the youth and, and, and the community, you know, we tend to have such a negative connotation when um, someone says mental illness. And then when you talk about mental health, there's still a, a negative connotation towards it. Is there a difference between mental health, mental illness, mental well-being? How do we change that narrative? What words can we use to make people more receptive to say, you know what, I'm mentally stable, I'm mentally well, or I have a mental issue? you must go to a mental health practitioner, whether it's a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker, who is able to then diagnose based on your specific um, experiences that you're having, and then two, have a specific care plan for you. I may not be good in mathematics. That doesn't mean Stephen, as an individual, is not intelligent. Is that I have a challenge with this specific issue. So therefore, what do I need to do? Seek support for that specific issue. Um, and then your overall mental health and overall well-being is inclusive of your societal um, engagements, family, uh, access to food, sleeping well, eating well, all of those things. So all of those things can still happen and you can still have a mental illness, right? Yeah. And therefore, when you seek support, it's for that specific issue. But also the care plan then is thinking about your full spectrum of you as a human being and providing that care plan for you there. Mm -hmm. And as a society, what we then unfortunately also do is that we try to seek for services, for example, from uh, faith-based leaders, right? And we try and pray away mental illness away. There is a place for spiritual and faith-based support uh, through encouragement, through you know, working with somebody, but there's a place for somebody who's qualified to be able to diagnose that and be able to provide a care plan and, and treatment that is necessary in the full spectrum of the person. So I think what we need to really differentiate is around what mental illness is, and that's diagnosed by a professional, mental well-being, which is your overall well-being as a human being. And then when you talk about mental health, to be able to speak about where is my state of being at this current moment, yeah. as opposed to um, a tr my, my, my diagnosis of who I am. Uh, for a specific period of time and everyone can go through a mental health and mental well-being uh, um, phase in their life correct it's not a matter of 
you know, I'm so strong and I'm confident and I've got this every day. I, I, I just want to put it out there because, you know, I know people that tend to, to make those remarks and comments and say, you know what, I don't suffer from mental health or a mental problem because I work out, I eat right. <laughs> But I think that one day when you're just not going, when things are just not going the right way, I think you're having some type of a mental episode or so mental health. I would say it's not necessarily a mental episode. Okay. I think when you talk about the mental uh, health challenges that you have, mm -hmm. is that all of us experience them in different forms, mm -hmm. right? Now, how I would normally define is that when you think about your inner resources, do you have the inner resources to kind of deal with what is around you, right? So sometimes, for example, stress. Mm -hmm. Stress is a part of our lives, right? You're stressed when you go driving, when you go to school, etc. There's some some level of pressure um, that is uh, that is applying stress or anxiety there. Now, normally you're able to kind of ride through it or realize that this is like a seasonal thing. Maybe it's a two weeks that you have to do something at work and it's really a lot of pressure on you. You ride through it, you get over it. Now it becomes a challenge when that um, experience becomes stretched out, where it starts to impede your day-to-day -day life where now um, you're so stressed or anxious, for example, that you don't even want to wake up and go to work. Or you feel so stressed and anxious that you, um, when you're speaking to somebody, for example, you don't even really know how to articulate what you're going through. Um, or you, when you're walking in social settings, you, bec you become tense and you want to isolate. So when it starts to impede your social day-to-day -day life, that is when you need to seek for support for, right? And so a lot of the times we think about that as in saying it has, it has to be a mental diagnosis and then as you're diagnosed, that's going to be like your label for the rest of your life. Yeah. No, it is that you need the specific support. So you go see a psychologist, you see a counselor, you speak through it, they give you necessarily some tools to be able to uh, deal with that and then you're able to be fine. And then other times when it's a mental illness, that has to do much more with your psychological, physiological uh, challenges that you're having that is diagnosed by, for example, a professional and they provide, again, a care plan. So we should not see these things as equal, right? Like this person is this way and this person is this way. It's, it's about an individualized care plan for you. So we can experience anxiety, Leandre and I, but the care plan that will be provided based on our background, our history, where we're coming from, will be completely different. Yeah. So therefore, we cannot equalize those two things. Yeah. And I think maybe also important to mention is we can do a little bit of a comparison for us to understand it better. Our physical health is as important as our mental health. That's what mm. we hear all the time. So when we look at our physical health, either of us might be diabetic because we have genetically inherited the risk of becoming a diabetic. But our lifestyle will sort of activate that gene and then we become diabetic or not, right? And the same is with our mental health. All of us grow up in a certain environment and we have certain genes that we inherit from the people that have birthed us. So what happens is life circumstances might activate certain genes that make us develop mental illness. Now I think this can help us just debunk the thing of mental illness means that we are weak or that we are not strong or that there's something wrong with us because we go through life Certain people start to struggle with certain things, be it how they think, be it how they experience certain, ex um, like a loss of a loved one, it might be different for two people. But that is because of a combination of how we were raised, what our coping resources are, and what our genetic um, risk factors have been. So it's like physical health. It's a combination of factors and everyone can struggle with it from time to time. We also have what we call the mental health continuum that talks about how we have mental health on the one end and how it deteriorates based on our life experiences and possibly the activation of certain inherited factors. So when we have mental health, we are healthy, we are functioning well, we are not very vulnerable. As we start experiencing certain stresses in our life or as age comes on and certain genetic factors are activated, we might move towards mental illness, but there are stages in between. Now this is when, when we are at mental health, we can help ourselves, we can benefit from social support, we have good resources for coping. But when we graduate towards mental illness, this is where we start needing professional intervention to sort of help us get back to a more healthy way of functioning. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We'll take a quick break and get back to the show. My encouragement to all the men is that mental health services are available for all of us. You don't have to be strong, you don't have to be okay. 
and even if you feel like you are fine uh call out to somebody else reach out to somebody um there are fantastic uh, organizations that are available as men we don't have to be all figured out about everything that we're going through this is a time for us to make the investment in our mental health so that we can be better partners for the people that are around us so use the services that are available How we think about men seeking help is not that they're going to come and start to talk, okay, cool, so I have this problem, this is going to go on, it's what's happening, etc. It is about being patient. So if somebody doesn't speak for a session, it's okay, <laughs> right? But this pressure to always be able to verbalize what you're experiencing at the immediate onset is sometimes what puts people off. Unfortunately, mental health services are not widely available and they are also not they're affordable. There's a couple of uh, organizations that provide free services such as Regain Trust and Lifeline Child Learning, etc. But for most majority of people, they unfortunately they don't know where the services are. And two, many of whom, for example, seek for mental health support, don't have medical aid and therefore are not able to access these things. So it is a myriad of issues that are both structural, that is impeding both men and women, but particularly men, um, about how we think about it. And the broader, greater conversation around how we how we socialize our men and boys mm -hmm. around how they are supposed to seek for support. So we tell culture. So we tell men, for example, to say, uh, be strong, right? Don't cry. Um, <laughs> be the man of the house you're the only man here be there for your mother support her don't play with dolls don't um engage in this rather play with guns and cars etc and then this boy grows up this way have almost been socialized and in a culture that's very toxic also about like uh when you see a girl make sure that you lock her in and make sure that she gets pregnant um Never about do I want to be in a long-term relationship with this person if they're going to become a mother of my child. It's about just what can I get from this person immediately. And then moving from that between the ages of uh, 10 to maybe 19, 20 to about 30, now this young man uh, is getting to a relationship. All of a sudden, his partner is asking, so why are you not talking to me? What is, why are you not expressing how you're feeling? He has never had the opportunity to actually verbalize how he feels. Mm. So it's almost one uh, now caught in a paradox because at one hand, we taught young men to say, be strong, don't speak about it, just get over it, don't cry. Even if somebody hurts you or if somebody dies, don't experience these emotions you're having. Their partner is saying, why are you like a wall <laughs> and not engaging? So our socialization also has a significant impact of how men engage mental health services and how they offer themselves up in seeking services in general as well. Um, Leandre, that brings me to the question um, when it comes to suicide. I've read um, on internet that a lot of women attempt uh, uh, to commit suicide or they think about committing suicide as, as opposed to men that actually successfully go through with suicide. Uh, what Stephen has just mentioned, is that part of a contributing factor as to why men successfully go through with um, suicide as opposed to women that would think about it, but then they would always go out there, seek help or try other types of interventions, whereas men, once they think about it, they go through with it. I think the first thing to remember is that suicide is in most cases not separate from an individual's mental health and their functioning, right? So when we look at what he said, Stephen says that the way that we raise men sometimes, or boys, it, it teaches them not to express their emotions. That sort of cuts off lifelines that they can use to cope with difficult life experiences. So chances are that they might be more vulnerable to developing certain mental health challenges. And now, because of the stigma created around seeking help in the first place for men, because it's not considered masculine, men should be able to take care of themselves and they should not cry. That stigma prevents them from now dealing with this challenge that has been created by the same system, right? Now let's look at suicide, for example. When it comes to ways of expressing difficult emotions, suicide, wanting to end one's life, or something like a self-harm behavior related to cutting, or um, maybe uh, using other forms of self-harm like burning yourself with an iron, um, those are behaviors that are also different in men and women. It, uh, what the research seems to point to is that men use more lethal forms of expressing difficult emotions when it comes to self-harm than women. And this might explain why more men die at suicide than do women.
Now that might be one one of the explanations that one can look at. But of course, it also goes back to how open are we to looking for healthy, adaptive ways of taking care of our mental health challenges when they do develop. Now, do men have the same freedom to do that? Then, um, as compared to women, because I think the other two things that were quite important for me that Stephen also touched on was that you know this concept of being masculine. Mm-hmm. Yeah? What does it mean about me when I speak about something that's difficult for me? So, is there a difference? Does everyone mean to tell me there's a difference between Stephen and I? Mm-hmm. If his grandmother dies and my grandmother dies, he is not allowed to cry, and I am. Where are those things meant to go? Because grieving and crying is a way of externalizing difficult emotions and that helps us to resolve them and find coping skills. Mm-hmm. And then looking, listening to one's peers sometimes isn't necessarily the best way of mm-hmm. doing things. It's just the most commonly practiced way of doing things. And we know there are um, these, um, the concept of harmful cultural practices mm-hmm. That is how we transfer maladaptive ways of taking care of our mental health over and over and over. Because we consult our peers and not science and research and professional um, avenues. Yeah. I think what's also critical to what Deandre is saying is that unfortunately, when you don't spend seek for help, mm-hmm. you end up in harmful coping mechanisms, mm-hmm. right? So that's why you see a significant number of substance abuse, for example, amongst men um, using violence as a form of communication um you start to see for example a lot of them isolating from their peers and the social groups etc um and then that's a form that they're now using to take care of themselves which is actually not healthy um because they've not learned to to develop those healthy connections healthy relationships be able to articulate with their feelings um and be able to uh, put boundaries in place and that's why for example you see what um even breakdown of relationships is almost like an attack on myself and my masculinity because now it's expected in society for example for me to be in a relationship and be the one that breaks up and not be the one that is broken off do you mm. see what i mean so all of these factors then kind of start to play in uh, many of our men's li- uh, minds and also the society uh, the 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 community of brotherhoods that they have can also be toxic as much as they are helpful as a support system can also be toxic because they reinforce some of these negative um, coping mechanisms. Yeah. I strongly believe that more men should um, come out there and be activists for mental health, you know. Uh, yeah, just as you said, it, it, it probably would be more effective if men start teaching men how to deal with these things and cope with them. And, make them also realize that it is okay not to be okay, you know? It is fine to cry, it's normal to show your vulnerability, especially within your family and your space of friends and so forth. Um, That brings me to my next question. Is there a difference between the signs and symptoms that one can pick up when it comes to mental health and suicidal thoughts? When do you start differentiating those two? Like, okay, fine, okay, this is now my mental health thoughts or signs and symptoms that I can look into. And when do you start seeking help to say like, you know what, I'm now going through a suicidal process where I'm really going to hurt myself. What are the signs and symptoms that people can look out for just to differentiate between that two if they are in? Yeah. So you see, I said earlier that suicide is most of the time a part of a mental illness. Eh? Mm-hmm. Now, suicide can be part of a mental illness or it can be a crisis situation in which an individual's resources to cope with that challenge just completely breaks down. So when it comes to mental illness, we have different classifications of mental illness. We have mood disorders, we have anxiety disorders, we have substance use disorders, we have personality disorders, we have trauma and stress-related disorders. There are many different mental illnesses that people suffer from, but there are certain of them to which um, suicide is common because of the nature of the suffering that that individual endures, right? So when we look at, at um, depression, for example, there would be signs such as um, um, continuous difficulty sleeping, continuous low mood, continuous loss of pleasure, continuous appetite changes, continuous hopelessness and helplessness. And we say, I'm saying continuous over and over because it's not I woke up today and I'm not feeling too good about today. It's mm-hmm. This has been a, a duration, more than two weeks, and it's there most of the time. So then that sense of hopelessness, I don't want to live anymore. I want the suffering to end. That is usually what is involved when individuals commit suicide. Mm-hmm. Yeah? But then in terms of a crisis situation, 
sometimes we become so emotionally overwhelmed when we look at what our problem is that all of our rational thinking goes out of the window. We cannot think of a solution to the problem. We cannot see a tomorrow or a future. All we can see is a way out of it. And this is also what we need to look out for with one another, our family, our friends, because in that moment, when someone can just help you sit, put your feet on the ground and find a little bit of reasoning again, it often helps you to also address that problem which seems so impossible. No? Um, I was just wondering, you know, there are a lot of people out there also when we uh, go out and we do our wellness awareness and stuff, you see people, the way that they talk, that some of them have probably given up hope in going to a clinical psychologist or even in uh, at a social worker because there's already this negative connotation of, you know, I'm just going to go and I'm going to sit and talk and they're going to tell me what I already know. When do you reach for something? When do you do something different? When do you take a different route when you feel that the resources that are available for you right now is just not working for you? You know, you find people with medical aid, they just don't make use of seeing a clinical psychologist or a therapist or even a social worker, maybe because of the negative connotation. But some of them have probably been going to a clinical psychologist or a social worker, but the resources are just not working for them. What, what is the next step before you get to a step where you take your own life? You know, I think there's a, a very big element of fear in terms of seeking help. There is the thing of I'm not masculine enough or I'm not strong enough, which is a stigma that we maintain in the way that we speak as a society. So that stops people from seeking help. But also sometimes we realize that there are certain behaviors that we are engaging in, perhaps being very aggressive and violent, perhaps excessively using a substance, perhaps um, jeopardizing ourselves at work, perhaps um, expressing serious jealous uh, traits in a relationship. There are these behaviors that are indications that maybe somewhere in terms of our mental health, we have a little bit of an injury or we're not functioning as we can be. The problem is, if we have to address mental health, we have to first be able to admit to ourselves that this behavioral thing here is not how the best that my life can be. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of us, it's easier to be in denial about those things than to confront them because we don't know how to deal with them once we do. And, and, and so I think, if that is a barrier that we can learn to, a song that we can learn to sing with mental health awareness to say, you know what, I need to accept that there are certain things about me that are not giving me or making me live my best life. Mm. It's not a life worth living. Mm. Is there something that I can do about these things? Another element of what you're talking about is sometimes you go for therapy and then I've had numerous clients say, you know what, this doesn't work for me or therapy didn't work for me in the past. This is why therapy occurs in a, a healthy relationship. Mm. My client should be able to tell me, you are not assisting me. I feel like we are stuck. And when we go to mental health services providers, as the public, we should hold them accountable for what it is that they are rendering us. We should help them guide us by being honest. But often that is also a difficult thing mm. because we have to be honest. No? Yeah. So maybe a little bit of an encouragement for people to say, when your life is not your best life, mm. look for help. Mm. Don't, don't just say, don't normalize it and be complacent about it. There are professional ways of getting help. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say also that there's a level of comfort mm. that comes with us remaining in our dysfunction because it's familiar. That is so true. Right? <laughs> well <Yeah>. said. <laughs> and to almost rock you out of that space uh, and to actually believe that there is more that you can have, that you can live your best life, um, is also that mental hurdle that we need to help people overcome. To say that this that you're experiencing is not everything that you have to experience. There's more that you can have. It can be better. You can have a quality relationship. Because mm -hmm. sometimes people say, I can't leave this person because where will I find somebody else to love me? Or um, I can't leave this toxic work environment because I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford to get into another job. Or I can't leave um, this uh, situation here because 
um, and it's better than the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Yeah. And sometimes we rationalize some of this like toxic spaces that we live in. And I think it's understanding that you can have and you deserve to have more, right? That you seek for that services. And I think as Leandra has said, part of that is also understanding that we have to be able to think about where are we now as a community and as a, a people and about how we engage mental health services and about our ideas around mental health um, and think about how we use words to almost stop people from seeking help right mm -hmm. so the words for example that we use like saying no i also struggled with those things i'm fine i was also beaten in class mm -hmm. i'm fine uh, my mom also used to do this i'm fine you what we're doing is we're minimizing somebody's experience mm -hmm. and to actually say that your experience is valid your feelings that you're experiencing right now are valid let us find you the support that you need as opposed to trying to and i think we sometimes do it in not malice it's not mal malicious yes. right you're doing it as a way to try and help the person as far yeah. as you can yeah. but you're limited in your scope of, exactly but i think that also yeah. takes us back to norms right exactly how we generally talk you know there are certain expressions in our vernaculars mm -hmm. that we use that when you think about them they actually invalidate the fact that someone has a mental health component to them yep. and they invalidate people's feelings they invalidate people's struggles you know validating a feeling is so so powerful because mm. it says there is a problem can we do something about exactly. it but when we invalidate <coughs> it makes people even reluctant to express that there is a problem yep. i'm experiencing a challenge okay. yeah well let's take a quick break and come back to our conversation As NMC, we have made provision for clinical psychology and psychiatric support on all our medical aid options. So do not suffer in silence. Go out there, assistance is there for you. As we're reaching the end of our conversation, I believe it's important for us to just gather the tools and knowledge for us to deal with mental health and also to find out, is there good mental health? Leandre, I was having a conversation um, with one of our employer groups while we were doing the grief and counseling sessions. And one of uh, the members concern was, is there good mental health? And if there is good mental health, how do we shed more light on good mental health? Because, you know, mental health itself, we're always just talking about depression, anxiety, and just the negative aspect of it. But is there good mental health? And how do we bring good mental health back into the society to make it more relevant or not relevant but more strong to say you know there's good mental health i think janine um one of the, our opening um topics was differentiating mental health from mental illness and i think having conversations as such already highlights to us that there's a lot of value to mental health and that it's important and that it's separate from bad but i also do think that we've only recently started having conversations about mental health so a lot of the focus has been on educating people on the challenges of um, related to mental health the challenges that people are experiencing the importance of help seeking and it's as though right now we are facing the crisis of mental health and that's why a lot of the attention has gone to that i do think that um, our society would not be functioning if there weren't a lot of mentally healthy individuals as well we wouldn't see things like healthy relationships we wouldn't see like things like successful companies we wouldn't see things like civil order um, so a lot of good things are happening as well and these would not be happening if mental health or the overall mental health condition wasn't good so a lot of bad publicity for mental health but it's important to remember like our mental health is our immune system like our emotional or cognitive immune system to challenging situations in life. It's how fast we are able to bounce back from difficult situations. And that's why we want to invest in self-care that takes care of our mental health. You also mentioned that uh, mental health should be a lifestyle. Uh, um, can you just shed some more light onto that? 
Okay, so maybe we can relate that to physical health a little bit. Mm -hmm. The same way that we take care of our physical health on a daily basis, you know, the, we go for exercise, we try to eat healthy, we get enough rest. I think it's important that we sort of develop a lifestyle that takes care of our mental health as well. And that would relate to how much rest we get, how we take care of our personal relationships, how we deal with difficult emotions and difficult life experiences. And I think in that way, we could shift the focus from having to be on taking care of mental illness the whole time to a place where we are nurturing and promoting good, healthy mental functioning so that we are more resilient to the challenges of life. Um, and I think just taking from that resilience, it's about providing a conducive environment. So making sure that mental health is accessible. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be able to invest more in the mental health space, particularly get more graduates in the mental health uh, space, to go into the schools, to go into communities, to go into villages and to be able to just be present. Because mm. I think a lot of the times all our funding goes to projects to say we're going to do a specific day or a specific month. Mm. And once that month is kind of done, we continue with life. Mm. Uh, but it's almost having that sustained intervention where I know Stephen is there uh, down the road. If at any point I need something, I can kind of call on to him because I may not need him today when it's mm. mental health month, mm. but maybe I'll need him in January, which is not mental health month necessarily. Yeah. Right. So making sure that it's visible, it's sustained. And then the last thing also is to really think about how we think about the well-being of people. As I think Leandria has spoken about our overall well-being to celebrate um positive uh, coping mechanisms uh, and, to, and to inculcate those a little bit more stronger. Think about what are the resources in our communities that are actually helpful, right? So uh, how we, for example, do funerals, which our community support to really celebrate those, those things that inculcate more healthy mental uh, coping mechanisms. Thinking about the kinds of foods that we eat and make getting enough rest, uh, turning off our cell phones, uh, going, to, going home after five you know, at work, not always working late all the time, getting enough sleep. And and really promoting those, like having rest days as part of mental health as corporates, right? To say, yeah. we're going to take over Wednesday and then we're going to just close the office early today and then let all the employees go home and rest. So those kind of um, healthy uh, ways of engaging is also what promotes uh, mental health and is able to build the resilience and build this the the, the fortitude so that when, this, uh, when stresses come, the person is able to respond. Uh, but when you have been attacked and you're so busy and so intense all the time, when those stresses come, they just kind of throw you over the edge. So yeah. really think about how do you inculcate those on a broader level in a sustained manner. Yeah, I think um, something just tying on to that is we have a lot of community resources already that are able to support mental health functioning and to promote healthy mental health and well-being. Um, I know in Zimbabwe, for example, they did a, 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 a sort of intervention where at a community level, they trained some of the elders in being able to have a listening ear and being able to provide support. Mm. And they found that that's actually a very good intervention for depression. Mm. And you see, we have those resources in our society, but we need to find ways to put the crisis management of mental health intervention on hold or manage it while at the same time thinking about the long-term sustainable effective interventions. So if we could train all of the grannies in Namibia, beautiful, they could train their daughters or their sons and so we could forward a generational... Mm. Their community-based like, counselors. Exactly, mm -hmm. you know. Our Namibian system currently the structure when it comes to mental health, where do we need the most intervention? Where do we need to deconstruct and reconstruct? You know, Stephen, earlier before we started recording, spoke about the macro level influencing the individual person's life. And I think to answer that question, one would have to address levels within the, the, the small, small system here meaning starting conversations about mental health within our household. Yeah. But even before that, perhaps with ourselves, to say, let me um, take it upon myself to go and read about mental health. Mm -hmm. Let me get a profile of what my mental health is like, what my functioning is like, am I okay? Do I need to take better care of myself? And then extending it to our families mm -hmm. to say, how do we teach our children about mental health? Yeah. And how do we not only teach our children about mental health, mm -hmm. but how do we parent them? How do we nurture them? How do we validate their feelings? How we, do we teach them to take care of themselves, to have healthy coping skills? And then we start to sort of start the dialogue in our families, sending these children then out into a society where they can have an influence that goes in a positive direction.
But um, I also like what Stephen said earlier, relating to how we need more trained professionals to be able to manage um, the the demand that there is for mental health intervention. I think they, that we have a lack of research that is localized to Namibia relating to mental health. So now one is stuck again between, do I become an ep- academic who does research so that there can be long-term interventions that are effective for our society, or do I do clinical work where people are in dire need and where they need clinical interventions? So maybe funding for research would be important. And then maybe it also part public-private um, collaboration, because I do know that we only have one um, recognized state facility that, that um, renders mental health services where there are psychiatrists and psychologists, but they are also overwhelmed in terms of their workload. Um, that's the one here in Ventu. And also for people to access those services, because it's such a uh, general treating center, there's so much stigma and um, people are reluctant to go there, they default on their medication, often they don't have the resources like taxi money to go for their follow-up um, treatments. And so what does it do? It leaves a picture of a uh, watered down mental health service provision. Mm. And I think also really recognizing that we're living in an unequal world, right? Mm. And the inequalities that we face have a direct impact on our mental well-being. So when somebody is growing up in poverty, in cycles of um, violence, growing up in a space where they are not getting the full support they need, where there's not a psychologist in the school. Um, so when those things are not there, when the environment is not enabling, it does put a stress on your mental well-being, right? Even something as simple as not having food to eat, right? So it's really thinking about as a society, how do we try and help a broad spectrum of people to lift them out of these inequalities as far as we can, because that already then reduces these, the need for mental health services. And then the second thing, I think we agree with everything that Leandre has said, is also think about having educational programs around this, right? So talking to people so that it normalizes this conversation. It must become an everyday story. Um, even in our schools, uh, a friend of mine mentioned that how they had a, a counselor in their school um, and some of the learners who were learning difficulties were part of the school. And then they had an open conversation about it to say that these learners will maybe get in 15 minutes extra time during a test. The rest of you finish your test at this point of time. Yeah. So it doesn't like, oh, those are like the secret kids that, hey, where do they get special treatment, yeah. whatever. It was an open, it was non judgmental space for them to be able to speak about it and get the necessary support that they need. But right now, it's very shrouded in secrecy, it's shrouded in darkness. There's a few people that kind of look for it and it's, like those ones with a specific illness and stuff like that. So I think normalizing the conversation on our televisions, in our newspapers, I'm talking about the challenges we're having, even myself as a professional, the challenges that I'm having with my mental health as well. And really realizing that it's not a specialized uh, thing that only affects a specific group of yes. people, but it's something that affects us all in different forms. Yeah. And therefore help seeking is not something that is just set aside for somebody uh, specifically for mental illness but all of us can seek help whether it's saying um, I need to see a, um, an educational psychologist for an aptitude test to seeing a psychiatrist for a mental health uh, mental illness uh, support that seeking for that service is not something that should be viewed and seen as a weakness um, on you but actually part of your full spectrum of support that you need you need a medical doctor you need a dietitian you need a fitness coach you need a financial coach you also need a psychologist so it's a full spectrum of support that you need and really seeing it from that perspective as opposed to saying like i need to kind of hide and try and look for the service i do see a clinical psychologist because i am able to And I do it because, not necessarily because there's a problem, I do it because of personal development, I do it because it's easier, I do it because I think it's it's necessary to go out there and just seek help. And it's not just about seeking help, I don't know what to say about it, I'm so passionate about just going to a clinical psychologist, sometimes you just go and you sit, because you know the person just doesn't know you, there's no judgement and sometimes they really do give you the necessary tools to just move forward. So I wanted to pose that question, Stephen, Leandre, do you seek clinical or social uh, um, psychology help? So what it has helped me to do is really allowed me to have a better sense of 
uh, myself and my mm-hmm. self-concept around what is what I'm good at, what I'm not so good at, where I do well, where I don't do well, where I need support, etc. And it has made me a better human being. It has made me a better friend to my friends. It has made me a better brother to my family. It has made me a better son. It has made me a better professional as a result thereof. Um, being able to just cross it for somebody else. Mm. Yeah. My sister likes to talk about how therapy is one of the most beautiful gifts that she knows about. And yes, my answer is also short. Yes, I also I also do go for sessions when I need to, um, both, as Stephen said, for professional consultation, like um, to hold yourself accountable and to be a responsible practitioner. But also sometimes, you know, as an individual, we get clouded by our own emotions and then it's difficult. A doctor can't be their own doctor. A yep. nurse can't be their own nurse. And if I want to continue to be responsible in practicing, but also a responsible functioning human being, mm. I recognize the importance of getting professional help when it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to end it off, in commemoration of Mental Health Awareness Month, I know we also spoke about it earlier and we're very passionate about it that mental health should not just be a once-off thing where we commemorate it every September and October. But in fact, it should be from the 1st of January to the end of December, every day of our life. With that being said, do you have any advice or any guidance that you can give out to our members, maybe to encourage them if they should need help or um, if there's anyone out there that's probably going through thoughts of attempt suicide or, you know, just in a very bad space uh, with COVID, with everything that we're going through, you know, financial loss loss of lives and stuff like that. People are just not doing okay. And you know, it's easy to say it's okay not to be okay, but I don't know how accessible the resources are for whoever is going through that. And hopefully they are tuned into the show and they're watching this and it makes sense to them. Yeah. I think um, from my side, I would say the fact that we know we're not okay mm-hmm. means we know what it feels like to be okay. Yeah. Mm. Or it, it, it means that we think what it could feel like to be okay and if we know we're not okay it means there's something that we have to do about it whether it's something that we have to do on our own or whether we have to seek help or whether we have to speak to just our neighbor to get an expression of that thing that is not okay and um, that's what i would say feel your feeling if your feeling tells you you are not okay it means you are not okay don't suppress it don't go past it find a way that feels safe for you to express that and to seek help for it. But then in addition to that, we have some agencies that can offer help, even though, uh, and and the the theme for this year uh, for Mental Health Awareness Month is even related to, in um, in, there's not access for everyone. How do you, what do you call that? In- inaccessible. Inaccessibility. Yeah, it's not an equal opportunity mm. for everyone mm. to mental health services. So I know that is very much true for our country as well. But what I do know is that there are people that are willing to help. There are private practitioners doing pro bono work. There is the government um, facility that has trained individuals to do it. There's Lifeline, Childline, there's Office of the First Lady. So there are so many agencies that if one continues to look for assistance, you are likely to get some assistance. No? What I would say is we have more than we actually realize mm. as people. Um, and part of our resilience building is really pulling in the resources that are available for us, both internally and around us. Um, and I'm always um, humbled when I hear the stories of the people that we engage, um, the, the circumstances within which they're able to pull through. Yeah. And that tells me that we have resilience already within inside of us. Mm. So when you're looking for mental health support, it's not to fix anything. Yeah. It's literally just to help you to move closer to where you want to go. Right. And to frame it from that perspective. And it's imperative, I think, for uh, private sector, particularly to think about how do we make investments in the mental health space that is going to have long pack in, uh, long term impact, mm. because we have to also we're not divorced from our colonial history um, coming from about all this violence that has come through as a result in the last 30 years. 30 yeah. years is not a long time. Mm-hmm. So the underlying trauma also lives loudly in our country. Mm-hmm. And so part of our response, and this critical one, is 
to build a holistic and a wholesome uh, society means we have to do with and un process trauma religion in our society as well um with covid um what it has done is has elevated this conversation around mental health great that we're having a conversation what is the uh, interventions and there are fantastic interventions already going through the Indian Senate funding. Mm -hmm. um, Glenda already mentioned about the Regain Trusts and the Lifelines, etc. Fantastic NGOs doing amazing work. If we can provide support and funding for those guys to be able to expand and scale that work, that will be much more impactful. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as we're thinking about COVID as well, we're not through it yet as well, right? So lots of people have lost loved ones, they've lost livelihoods, um, they've been experiencing lots of mental health breakdowns, living isolated, not having community, no social support, all of those kind of things. So COVID has ex exasperated what is already existing. Mm. It has not caused it. Mm. And therefore, as we start to reflect around building back better and investment, this has to be a critical one that we have to think about because our economics cannot function, our workers cannot function, our schools cannot function if people are broken, if people are wounded, if people are not mentally sound. So the investment in mental health is more critical and imperative as a nation for us now more than ever before. This has really been a very interesting conversation and I hope if there's one thing that people can take out there is that uh, be open about it, be very um, receptive about it. There is help out there. Uh, and I think we just need to bring more emphasis surrounding uh, the type of services that are available there to our people, you know, even if it is an ad that plays on our local television every day, just to let them know that there is help out there. I was thinking while you guys were talking, maybe we can come up with a hashtag. Hashtag I'm mental able. I'm able to do anything. I don't know. <laughs> okay, with that being said, thank you so much and see you on our next episode with On the Couch with NMC.